But Mike, welcome. Thanks, uh, thanks. It's, uh, it's an honor to have you here. Um, it's an honor for me to be able to sit here with you as uh, you know, on the journalist side of, uh, representing Security Week. It's, uh, I think a lot of people would uh, love to be in the position I'm in, and I'm honored to have you. No, thanks. thanks for taking the time out of your busy schedule. Uh, I know you've retired from active <laughs> I duty. Transitioned. And I have transitioned. I have really uh, transitioned into you know, uh, some new things and probably some really interesting things to come, so we're, we're happy to learn a little bit about that. Um, just, just, just really honored to have you. Um, just want to set, you know, most people know you recently as being director of uh, NSA and Cyber Command mm -hmm. over the, what, since 2014. Can you just give us, I'm, I'm always a, a big fan of context, you know, knowing a little bit more about your background before that, because you weren't just doing this, this type of role or Great. that type mm -hmm. of role. Can you kind of bring us back, you know, you had 37 years uh, in the Navy, thank you for that. Um, Take us back a little bit, give us a little context. So first, look, I, I thank you all very much for the, for the kind applause, but I'm only here today because I was a part of great teams, and in the course of 37 years in uniform, I just got to work with some great men and women. We're doing things that I thought mattered to the nation, and we were able to generate some really positive, doesn't mean we were perfect, but collectively as teams, we were able to do some really great work, even as we acknowledge that there's always ways to be better, and at times we didn't meet our own standard. Um, so for me, I, I'm very fortunate as I tell my, I, we, my wife and I have been married for 34 years, which is the thing I tell, you know, people ask me, aren't you proud to have been a four star and a, you know, the commander of one of the 10 senior operational commanders in the DOD and you ran the largest intelligence organization in the world outside of Moscow, Beijing or Pyongyang. And I go, no, the thing I'm proudest of is I've been married for 34 years and together we raised two sons that I respect and I love being around. Um, who are good people and who want to try to make the world a better place. That's, that's the thing that means the most to me. Um, I, but as I tell my sons, look, I was so lucky. I literally knew exactly what I wanted to do when I was 11 years old. I went to my parents. I didn't come from a military family. I grew up in Chicago. Um, but I read stories of the sea. I couldn't get enough of reading. And when I was 11, literally, I'm like in sixth grade, I told my parents, I'm going to be a ship driver, I'm going to join the Navy, I'm going to be an officer, and I'm going to go to the Naval Academy. Now, I got most of that done except the Naval Academy. <laughs> um, as I then, so I always knew what I wanted to do. I tried to get in the Naval Academy, and I failed miserably. I just didn't have great grades. I had great test scores, but, uh, you know, not uncommon for some people. I found the focus you needed as a 17-year-old to not just be smart, but to be disciplined, be focused, and to be consistently applying your abilities. I found that really, really difficult and really challenging, and I just wasn't so good at it. Um, and so I, I didn't get into the Naval Academy, and you know, as I kid people, uh, well, hey, look, when you can't go to a service academy, you, uh, your fallback is you're looking for good football. So I went to an SEC school. I, I'm an Auburn graduate. Um, and I was a ROTC guy. I, I always knew I wanted to be a Naval officer, as I said, so I went to ROTC. I was commissioned as a surface individual. I started in a very traditional Navy career. I was on destroyers um, for my first five years. And in fact, at my retirement ceremony, I said the single most defining tour I ever had in 37 years was the very first one on that first ship. It shaped the way I looked at the world. It shaped my view of discipline. It shaped the way I, I problem solved. I learned so much in that first tour that shaped everything I did for the remaining, literally, you know, 35, 34 years after that. At, one, at some point though, after about five years, I decided, look, I wanna stay as a naval officer, but quite frankly, I didn't like some of the leadership I was seeing. And I just thought to myself, if you have to become like these people to achieve success, and I define success as I wanted to be the commanding officer of a ship. Um, I said, look, I'm just not gonna do it. It's not worth it. I won't become something that I don't believe in and I'm not gonna treat people like that. So I decided, stay in the Navy, but do something different that still lets you go to sea. And so for me, I changed into a very specialized field called cryptology, which is really signals intelligence. It's understanding opponents' communications, their radar systems, their digital data links. It's trying to, to gain access to that so you can help your side generate knowledge as to what the opponent is doing. I ended up doing that for 32 years. About 15 years into that journey, I was a captain, so I'd been in like 22 years. It's like 2001, it's the immediate aftermath of 9-11. Um, and I, I'm try, I have to get what they call joint qualified in the military. And meanwhile, I'm telling my 
my specialty in the Navy, look, I think there's a hole in my, as I look at my career, I have a hole. I think the future is about networks and interconnectivity. And if you look at what I've done, this is 2001, I said, if you look at what I've done, I've been a very traditional, tons of times at sea, submarines, airborne reconnaissance. I mean, I loved it, but I thought you gotta expand yourself. So I made it, I, I fought to try to get into cyber associated activities. I, I was fortunate, um, which I often highlight to people, look, sometimes you gotta be willing to put your own career, your own future on the line. Because when I did that at the time, I can still remember the leadership of my specialty said, well, um, you realize that the only job that's available that would give you that kind of experience is one level below your current pay grade. And this might affect your ability to promote. And we, we would just urge you not to do it. And I looked at them and I thought, I'm not doing this because I want to get promoted. I'm doing this because I want to be relevant and I want to try to generate value. And as I look at the future, this is a core specialty that's going to be incredibly relevant. So I always remind people, look, you have to be willing sometimes to go against the grain and do what you think is right, regardless of what your occupation is, regardless of how senior or how junior you are. So in 2003, I started getting into networks. I started getting into cyber. And I used to, uh, the other thing, I was very fortunate. I had some, it just worked out. I ended up working for some very senior people in the course of my time when I was a captain, a colonel in the other services. And I had people along the way who were willing to mentor me, who were willing to take a chance on me. And I can remember being told when I was a captain, and at the time I thought this was very bizarre. They said, Mike, we have no clue where the journey is gonna take you, but we think you have potential. And if you keep performing, we're gonna to try to put you in jobs. They're gonna grow you to the point where someday you could actually be the director of NSA and the commander of Cyber Command. I mean, I literally got told this like 15 years before it happened. And I'm mm -hmm. just, at the time I'm thinking, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> In my specialty, there had never been a four-star before. There had never been a three-star. The senior most person in my specialty in the history of the Navy had been a two-star. And I'm just looking at this going, yeah, thanks very much. But it, it just worked out this way. And I used to kid people. Look, they literally grew me from a test tube. I was mm -hmm. the first professional SIGINT officer, meaning that's what I did, to ever be head of the largest SIGINT organization in the U.S. government in the form of NSA. Um, I, I, so I was just very, very... Lucky. So as I became more senior, one of the things I always tried to do, and I apologize, I realize this is far beyond cybersecurity. I always felt one of my jobs as a leader was to keep thinking about how do you build the bench? How do you mentor? How do you build the next generation? Who are the individuals who are three, four levels below who one day, 10, 15 years from now, if they get the chance, they have the ability, they're going to be sitting in your job. I tried to do that at every level that I was ever a part of, because I always thought the human capital piece that's the most important, that's the hardest part. And even as I became Cyber Command and NSA, I mean, I used to tell the leadership of our nation, the hardest part isn't the technology. The hardest part is changing culture and human behavior. That's what's difficult about cyber. It, it, I'm not trying to argue that the, the technology is easy, but if you look at those survey results, the greater majority of them were in some way tied to the human dimension, not just the technological dimension. So then you, you took the role in, was it May 2014, April? April, 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 April 2014. 2014. So you The seen, day after April Fool Day. I refused to do it on <laughs> April the 1st. Rightfully so. We're not doing those so. on April Fool's Day. So, so, so you, you take the reins in April 2014. You've seen a lot of stuff leading up to that. But now you're in a totally diff different position. So let's, see, let's even fast forward from between 2014 and when you left in 2018. You know, what, it, just on our side, what we see, you know, in the private sector, tremendous activity, you know, yeah. malicious, non-malicious, uh, call it what you want. And can you talk to us about kind of what you saw, you know, throughout that kind of, that So it's time funny, when I, when I first got into these jobs in 2014, the number one question, and I got this in, in my confirmation hearing over and over again, for example, with the Senate was, Zero day vulnerability, zero day vulnerability, zero day vulnerability. The greatest concern is zero days. And, and I kept thinking, zero days are important, but if you look at the activity that's out there, 90 to 95% of it has zero to do with zero day vulnerabilities. The single greatest source of problem is an inability to patch, an inability to train, an inability to keep our systems configured in the ways we know they have to be. It's not, oh my God, not, not that it's not a a factor, but I said, look, it's not, zero days are not 
the big drivers. So one of the changes I would observe is you hear much less talk about zero days these days. And boy, five years ago, it, it was all about zero days. The world was going to come apart because of zero days. Um, so that would be one difference. Second difference, you go back and look, the majority of activity to me seemed to be focused on penetrating systems for either extraction of data, whether it was for commercial purposes in the form of a criminal or some other entity that wanted to generate revenue, or it was extracting data because you were a nation state and you were interested in stealing intellectual property or you were interested in espionage and pulling information. So it was largely about data and it was largely about IT systems. In the course of the, the, the next five years, I thought, while the IT piece is important, as I look ahead, I go, look, OT, 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 what are we doing about operating systems, you guys? It's not just data anymore. This hyper-connected world we've created, these ICS and SCADA systems that give us great benefit, speed, scale, efficiency. I'm not saying that the argument is, well, you don't want ICS, you don't want SCADA. On the other hand, I said, look, if you think somebody putting ransomware on core data is a potential significant event for you, what are you gonna do when you see ransomware applied in the OT arena? When you see people locking down your automated control systems, when you see people who are able to interrupt your basic production and operation capability, I said, if we, if we think it was tough in the IT world, this is gonna be even more impactful in the OT world. So I was always concerned that we're not spending enough time on the ICS piece of this. You're seeing also in the five years, the one thing that hasn't changed that surprises me in some ways is I thought that the non-state actor, read the terrorist in particular, would increasingly use cyber as a weapon. You, you've seen cyber used, not that it hasn't been used, but it hasn't been broadly adopted. You've seen terrorist groups use cyber as a tool to recruit, spread ideology, raise money, and coordinate among widely geographically dispersed elements within their organizations. You haven't seen them to date view it as a weapon system in the way that you see some nation states viewing cyber as a weapons capability. That, that, that's gonna change. It's only a question of the when, not the if. I'm surprised though it hasn't happened so far. You see nation states, um, for all the talk of nation states, that the greatest level of activity out there is still criminal and non-state actors. Probably 60, 65% of what you see is not nation states. It's criminal actors, it's entities that are trying to penetrate systems, largely because they either feel it's a way to generate money, whether it's we're stealing information that we can sell, whether it's we're using this as a way to lock down information and then you're gonna have to pay me to re remove the ransomware. So the greatest amount of activity is still criminal. Um, but what's interesting with the nation state is cyber has now become a tool, a, an element in a broader strategy. So if you look at the North Koreans, for example, um, you can tell that the sanctions that have been imposed on them in which they no longer are part of the global financial structure, they're restricted on the business they can do with the, the broader world. They can't move money internationally, so they're very, uh, isolated in many ways. They view cyber as a tool not only to generate knowledge and insight that gains them advantage, but they're the only nation state I ever saw that viewed cyber as a means to acquire money and to defeat some of the sanctions. So you see the North Koreans robbing banks through cyber. You see the North Koreans <laughs> mining um, digital currency. You see the North Koreans breaking into gaming, gambling, um, and sports sites because there's money. I've never seen a nation state engage in that kind of criminal behavior before. And again, they just view cyber as, well, this is, a, this is one element of a broader set of things we're doing to help us overcome these sanctions that have been imposed on us. If you look at the Russians, they always viewed cyber as a very strategic tool. It was a way for them to both gain potential military advantage if they got into a conflict with the United States from a military perspective. At the same time, 
They viewed cyber as a strategic capability that enabled them to put at risk capabilities within the United States. It's not by chance you find, you still see them, the Russians penetrating power structure, financial systems in the United States. Why? Their view is, if I can put those things at risk, that gives me potential strategic advantage. If we actually get into it with the Americans, that's a big positive for me. Um, and then lastly, and you really saw this kick up in 2016, although they had been doing it before, they viewed cyber as a new capacity in terms of their ability to really ramp up their traditional disinformation and psychological operation kind of efforts. And you saw that really play out in the 2016 election cycle where they both used cyber as a tool to penetrate parts of our electoral infrastructure, but they also use cyber as a tool to go after data that they thought if they could extract it and then release it would be embarrassing to the United States, would undermine our democratic institutions, would weaken us. Um, and so you saw them do that. And it wasn't that they hadn't done it before, but we had just never seen them do it at the scale that we watched. Um, the, the Chinese, on the other hand, Cyber is first and foremost a tool to overcome some of the economic advantage that the West has traditionally enjoyed. It's enabled them to go after core cutting edge technology, saving them billions of dollars in R&D investment costs and years in development timelines by stealing advanced technology from the United States and the West in general and then sharing it with their private sector. Um, you see the Chinese view, as do the Russians, um, as do we, um, to, to be fair, cyber offers us another tool in the traditional capabilities of espionage where we're trying to generate insights as to what is shaping a nation's strategy, what are the choices they're looking at making, how might that affect us, how might that affect our friends and allies, how do we need to position ourselves to anticipate some of those things that we're seeing. But the Chinese also view cyber like the Russians as a military capability that they intend to use to help negate some of the military advantages that we enjoy and also put them in a stronger operational position from a military perspective. So I always try to remind people, look, remember, cyber is an extension of a broader strategic intent. You need to understand the broader strategic intent. Because if you understand the intent, it starts to help you understand, so what's the target set they're gonna go after what are they really interested in? That helps you start to develop strategies as you're trying to figure, because it didn't matter if you're in the private sector or in the, in the government. The one thing that I thought united all of us, there are never enough resources to do everything we wanna do. So we are fundamentally in a risk-based calculus. Where can I take risk? Where should I invest scarce capability, scarce human capital? Because there isn't enough to go around. There's never enough money. You can never hire enough people. So you're trying to make risk-based decisions. It is the same way in the government. You know, as, as Cyber Command's responsibilities, we were tasked with defending the DOD's networks, weapon systems, data, platforms, and capabilities um, for this, you know, the largest department within the U.S. government, you know, millions of operators who operate networks at multiple classification levels around the world, from the battlefields of Afghanistan and Iraq to these large command and control centers from mobile units like aircraft, submarines, ships, people operating on the ground in small detachments um, who are constantly moving. So it wasn't an insignificant challenge, but I used to tell the, the Secretary of Defense, in the end, this is all about risk. And we gotta figure out a way that helps us manage risk so we can make prioritized decisions. Because if we didn't do it that way, my argument in the government was, and I said this as the cyber guy, I said, look, if we're not careful, we're gonna become the biggest cost sum to this government that it's ever seen. I'm just gonna be coming to you and I'm gonna be constantly asking for billions of dollars. And that is an unsustainable approach. We gotta get away from this. We can't buy our way out of this problem set. We can't human capital our way out of it. The answer isn't, well, we're just gonna hire all the people we need, we'll train all the people we need. After my you know, 15, almost 20 years now, focused on this particular problem set, I'm going, you can't human capital your way out of this. There's just not enough people, there's not enough money. So it starts to be, how do you make smart risk-based decisions and how do we prioritize? And my argument always was, prioritization starts not with me. How many of you are CIOs or CISOs or operate in CIO or CISOs teams as part of a team? Come on, put your hands up. Um, 
I mean, you guys have a tough job. Uh, you know, what, what I used to try to tell the leadership, because in some ways, you know, I was kind of the, the, the senior accountable, okay, Mike, when it goes wrong, you're the one that we blame. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I knew that going into it. I had no problem with that. I knew that was my job. Um, and it never bothered me. But what I used to try to tell my bosses was, look, you have to own this problem set. You know, Rogers and his bunch of merry men and band of men and women out at Fort Meade and around the world, we can't do this by ourselves. Number one, you have to decide what is the most relevant capacity and capability to generate the outcomes of this department. You don't want me making that decision. You need to make that decision. Because once you do that, based on that prioritization, number one, I got a priority. That helps me then develop a, a, a strategy to try to defend this. But if I try to defend everything in this global multi-million person, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars of organization at the same level, we're going to fail. It just doesn't scale. It doesn't size well. We've got to take a risk-based approach. In some areas, we can't take risk. One of the analogies I used to use was, um, and this came up because um, lots of organizations in the military, just like companies, we have unclassified websites where we try to communicate to the broader public that we serve. Here's who we are, here's what we do. They're all unclassified. They're available for anybody to access. I can remember a discussion one time where I said, look, for those kinds of capabilities, we can take a level of risk. If we lose an unclassified website, what's the operational impact? I said, on the other hand, we have an opponent who penetrates the nuclear command and control structure of this nation. We got a massive issue. We can't take risk there. That was interesting then. One of my comments to the leadership was, so if you accept that premise, if you believe what I'm telling you, there's an implication here for you as a leader. So when that unclassified website gets hacked, you know, standing up and jumping up and down and yelling about, you know, why I'm going, sir, we took a risk-based approach. We talked about this as the strategy. You as a leader have to be there for the execution of this strategy. Hey, this was a conscious decision we made on our part. We decided we could take risk in this area. Operational impact is minimal. It's an inconvenience and we'll deal with it. But I'm fully comfortable that the team's doing great work. So that's the model that we need here. Um, and, and it's not, it is not easy. Now I find myself in the private sector. I'm, I'm, I'm advising companies. I'm on some boards. And so now I'm an accountable individual in, in some companies. Now I find myself as one of those accountable individuals. And I'm constantly trying to remind my peers, we have to help the team. It can't be we're sitting here as the board or you're sitting here as the chief operating officer or the CEO. Hey, this isn't my job. This is my CIO and my CISO or my chief risk officer's job. I don't have anything to do with it. I just give them the money. I set the broad framework and it's up to them. Um, we allow ourselves to be, and it was true in the government, we allow ourselves to be really intimidated by technology. And I would watch incredibly senior, incredibly intelligent, really articulate, very visible people who would say to me, Mike, I don't understand this technology stuff. You do, you guys do it. And I wasn't the only one and part of the teams that we were a part of. You go out and, and do this. And I kept saying, sir, this is all about risk. You understand risk. You deal with it every day for our nation. Um, one of the examples I use with CEOs is, and boards, is how many of us have a financial background and have ever worked money? Some do, but many don't. I said, have you ever heard a board say, look, I don't do money, that's what my CFO does? <laughs> like the culture is, wait, you would never do that. Cyber's the same way to me. It, there's a lot of change here for cultures. There's a lot of change here for organizations. And they're trying to work their way through it, but it isn't gonna be easy. And it's about this ability to bring teams together that are both technical expertise, mm -hmm as well as broad operational authority, and they're gonna help you set the priorities, they're gonna help you build a risk framework for how you're gonna meet this challenge because you fundamentally always have this disconnect. There's too many requirements, there's not enough resources, whether it be people or technology. Another thing, and I apologize, I'm probably talking way too long. We're making life harder for cybersecurity. The rate of change keeps increasing, the complexity keeps increasing, so what we expect a workforce to be capable of doing, just keeps growing. The solutions that we are proposing are growing in complexity, 
And one of the things I used to say in government, both when it came to the, the R&D, NSA in particular had a, has a big R&D budget. We spent a lot of money trying to develop technologies that we could use and to try to make sure we could anticipate technologies that were coming down the road that we're gonna have to deal with. Um, one of the challenges that I always found was, number one, technology for the sake of technology means nothing to me. I kept going, look, we are only gonna invest in technology that helps us generate mission outcomes. I refuse to invest in technology that's just interesting. That's not our jobs, guys. We can't afford to do this. And that's not what the taxpayer has given us money for. I'm glad to share insights and knowledge with other teams so that they can do it because it's within their bailiwick, it's within their job jar. But guys, that's not our role, that's not us. We need to stay focused on what our role is here. But um, I found that you know, the technological piece got to be really, really challenging for organizations. And way too often, I watch people hide behind technology. Hey, I have no responsibility, I don't understand it. I was just, you don't accept that in any other area of business. Why would you accept this here? Yeah, that's a great point. Um, I wanna tra track back a little bit on what you were talking about on um, vulnerabilities and zero days. And mm -hmm. again, every, you know, in the news, they always make headlines, zero days, zero days. And turns out most of the breaches or credentials, very basic, you know, everything's, any company that gets breached, it's always a sophisticated cyber attack, and then you read the report and you're like, hmm, I don't know how sophisticated yeah, that so was, much. but, um, you know, how, how are you seeing, and you talked about it a little bit, um, whether it's different nation states that you've mentioned already, um, how are you seeing their tactics, or, you know, how did you see you know, as of last year when you retired, um, their capabilities, you know, from, from what so, you saw. You saw the capabilities of actors just growing. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's not a significant nation of the world today that isn't investing in this mm -hmm. set of capabilities. So you were watching their trade craft, their ability climb. Um, you were watching the breadth of capability climb. You're, you're seeing, and in fact, you just saw an announcement from NSA and the <clears throat> National Cybersecurity Center in the United Kingdom in, in England. You're starting to see some nation state actors now try to mask themselves as other nation states. Mm -hmm. So you watch the Russians penetrate the Iranian structure to steal Iranian tools. That not, must not be new to you, and, right? No, I was gonna say, it's not. <laughs> I, was thinking, I saw that yesterday and said, uh, we, we've great seen to talk this about. But. Before, but it's interesting. You're mm -hmm. starting to see this more common. Mm -hmm where um, people are trying to hide identity. Because, you know, uh, when it comes to a response from a nation, it all starts with, do you have confidence that you know who the actor was? Are you confident that this really was fill in the blank, this criminal gang, the North Koreans, the Russians, the Iranians? Because if you don't have that confidence, everything gets shunted to the side and you just don't do anything. So the always, you know, having dealt with Sony and multi, you know, not Pitya, WannaCry, penetrations in U.S. infrastructure, the number one question that I would always get, you know, from the president or the, the secretary or the director of national intelligence or, or Congress in their oversight role was, okay, Mike, so what's your confidence level? And generally, I always thought we were able to, never perfection, but in general, I always felt pretty good about our ability to identify because if you can't identify who it is, you just don't do anything and everything shuts, yeah, what's the purpose? shuts yeah. to ground. Um, so you see nation states understand that. Mm -hmm. So increasingly you see criminal actors, you see nation states spending a lot of time trying to obscure. I think that's one of the Russians takeaways from the 2016. I mean, we freaking nailed them. <laughs> I mean, there was never, I mean, the case that we laid out, you know, one of the things I'm proudest of, the 2016 stuff, it didn't matter if it was multiple congressional investigations, it didn't matter if it was uh, a special prosecutor, I'm not talking about politics, everyone came back and said, we fundamentally agree with the conclusions of the intelligence community in that intelligence community assessment that we published yeah. in January, uh, or December 16, January of 17. Um, I mean, we really laid out a good case for, hey, here's, we can tell you who, we can tell you how. Um, so that, that definitely, it helps. But we do have to, I thought the fundamental challenge for us was, 
and I work this with two different administrations, how do we change the fundamental dynamic? Because if we can't convince actors out there, whether they're criminals or nation states, that what they're doing is in fact represents risk to them, they will only be encouraged to do more and they will become more and more escalatory. And if we don't change the dynamic, we are gonna be on the wrong end of the cost equation. Just passively responding to activity he said, I, I got it, it's what you pay me to do. But I would just say, look, this is a cost-intensive strategy. It is a passive strategy. It's a responsive strategy. Everything I learned in 37 years as a military officer was, I want to engage in actions that shape my adversary's choices. I want to drive my adversary to make choices that benefit me, not them. And by so doing, I place us in a better position. That's what we want to do. This passive just respond, ugh, that goes against everything I ever learned. It's just not the best way to do business. So I am happy to see that you see that evolving. You see that changing. I think that's a great compliment to the team that's doing this great work today. Yeah. All right, for sure. And one of the most important things that I want to talk about, and watching the clock to make sure that, that we get to this, um, as someone who works on conferences, puts together these conferences, and tries to make them valuable to people, um, a lot of conferences that I've attended and seen people talk about, you know, the public-private partnerships and we need to, we need to, we need to do more, we need more information sharing and then I don't see a ton of it, you know, there's organization after organization after organization popping up, it seems to be a lot of noise. Um, what sort of takeaways can we get? We've got people here from you know large manufacturing companies Check. down to local u utilities. Um, how can we do better actionable items? Not you know again, I, I kind of get tired of right. we need to do more, we need to share more, we need to foster intelligence. Like, how can we do better? And, and you know what you know you started I think in 2016 you talked about it a little bit yeah. here well, down the road. So talk. Ab I always said, look, the future to me fundamentally is about building integrated multidisciplinary teams to work problem sets. That's what we got to do. So if you look at the way we did business at Cyber Command, if you look at the, 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 the structuring process, the restructuring went through NSA, it was all powered by this fundamental premise. The future is about building integrated teams. The thing that always frustrated me about the private sector and the government was, guys, we're doing a lot of talking. I don't see an integrated team here. Tell me why, I, for example, I liked the sector approach to doing business. We had tried to, to do things very broadly mm -hmm. and in interfacing with the private sector, we would get, I don't use that model in my business or that, that's a very different risk equation for me. I don't care about that. We found it really hard when you're trying to deal with everybody, it got to be yeah. very difficult. And so the sector approach where we tried to break this down into 17 different segments of common in a language, common structure, common business outcomes, I thought was a very powerful idea. Where I thought we didn't take it far enough was, so within each of those sectors, I want an integrated structure where commercial individuals and government employees are sitting side by side working problem sets 24 seven. Mm -hmm. And we don't do that right now. Right. We tend to just say, well, we're gonna pass information. Mm -hmm. Put another way, part of Cyber Command's job was, our third mission was we were tasked to defend critical infrastructure if, we, if against significant cyber incidents or events. And what I used to tell our nation's leadership was, if you think you can just show up in the middle of a crisis and say, hey, we've never worked together before. We have no knowledge <laughs> of each other. I have no idea what your network structure is. I don't understand your processes and I really don't understand what it is you value, whether it be particular information or particular connectivity or capability. If you think you can just throw that all together in the first six hours of a cyber crisis, forget it. It just doesn't work like that. And my attitude was, I don't understand why we're not working integrated teams 24 seven every day that then become the starting point about gaining knowledge about each other, understanding our network structures, understanding culture, understanding what you value, understanding how you react to different events. I said, if we can do that day to day, then when we get in the middle of a crisis, we are so much smarter and faster. We get, already have a basis of cooperation and we just overlay the crisis to what we do every day. That's a much smarter way to do business, but we just haven't gotten there yet. And I find that frustrating because I said in the end, 
what matters. I don't care if you're in the private sector or you're in the, in the government. We all get paid to generate outcomes. That is what we're there for. I, I kid all my CIO and CISO and chief risk officer teammates, look, we're in the risk mitigation business. That's what I try to do in the government. That's what you're trying to do for your company. Within this realm known as cybersecurity, you're trying to mitigate risk for your organization. I try to do the same thing in the government. We're not so different in many ways. We're using the same tools. We're, we're using the same capabilities. We're using, in some ways, we're, we're trying to you know, use the same human capital mm -hmm. out there. Can't we do more together day to day in an integrated way? Sure. So, you, so you're not, you don't mean like more cyber defense exercises that happen once a year or well, not that those every aren't, six months? Right, not that those aren't a part of it, and we did those, mm -hmm. but I just said, look, people change so rapidly. Over the course of a couple of years, our workforce is swapping out, your mm -hmm. workforce is swapping out, so the people who went through some of that training, they're no longer with the organization, they're doing other jobs. It doesn't mean that exercises aren't valid, mm -hmm. But it does mean if, if you think that that can give you all you need, I don't think so. I just mm -hmm. didn't feel that way. Even though I was a big believer in exercises and we did a lot right, right, right. in that regard. What, what, so in, in that capacity, getting more specific, when you mean private sector, and let's talk about someone working at NSA, like when you say day to day, how is that interaction? So is for it, example, you know, somebody I don't, at I mean, a nuclear power if plant. If I was at, so let's take uh, power generation. Mm -hmm. So there is an ISAC for power generation. Uh, that's a sector coordinating. My comment was, why isn't there a security ops center for that sector? Why don't we have an integrated watch structure that, is that maintains situational awareness about broadly what is happening in the network structure within that sector? Mm -hmm. We don't do that right now. Instead, we, we email each other, mm -hmm. we do meetings, we have broad discussions. Not that those are bad things. Right. But again, we get paid to generate outcomes. And if you want to generate, if you want to get to outcome generation, you got to be willing to do things differently. Cyber is going to force us to get out of our comfort zone mm -hmm. because this idea of, well, either the government's just going to do it itself or companies are just going to do it by themselves yeah. is unworkable to me. I thought it was totally unrealistic to tell a company in the private sector, well, good luck holding off China. Mm -hmm. Hope it works out for you. I just thought you can't expect a single company, no matter how large, to have the resources, the insight, the capacity to withstand the determined efforts of a focused nation state or criminal actor. Likewise, I used to argue, look, you can't expect the government to do it by themselves. One of the things I used to say was, I can't defend what I can't see, what I have no knowledge of. And in our structure, the government sits outside private networks. So I'm not arguing that that is wrong. But if you expect me to try to defend them, I can't defend something I can't see, I have no knowledge of, I have little awareness of. That's why this partnership is so important. I was the first to admit, look, you don't want the government sitting inside your network structure. On the other hand, can't we partner in an integrated way where we're bringing your picture and my picture together so that we have a very integrated view about the activity we're seeing and the best way to handle it? Um, and we're doing this real time, think about how the level of knowledge is gonna rise. Think about how our familiarity with each other is gonna grow. Think about how the confidence we're gonna have in each other. Because when it really hits the fan, the, the trust, trust becomes everything. Mm -hmm. Trust is everything when you're in the middle of a crisis. And every one of you knows that when something goes wrong in your organization. Your boss's ability to believe in you and your team, even if they have imperfect knowledge and they're going, look, you know, Mike, I'm not a tech guy, but I believe in, you know, I believe in your team. I believe in its men and women. Okay, we'll do it. We'll do what you're telling me. Um, you got to start with trust. Mm -hmm. And I think that's from when I talk to people about at some of the ISACs, it sounds great to have these things set up, but it's only as good as what goes into it. Yeah. So and a lot of people are hesitant to share their, their information because it's like, oh, well, I, what if these you guys weren't, you know, in, don't have this? And, one you know, of the things that struck me in the survey result, you saw 33% of the respondees said company policy precluded me from discussing or acknowledging the breach. Mm -hmm. Another thing I used to tell the private sector is if we don't change this dynamic, mm -hmm. then we have the same issues over and over and over again. I want to create a structure where the pain of the one leads to the benefit of the many. But the way we're doing business now, the pain of the one is just forgotten, and it's the same pain for the next one, for the next one, for the next one. 
which was one of the reasons why during my time, um, and it, it continues, I was very adamant. We are gonna publicly acknowledge penetrations. Mm -hmm. We are gonna talk about how we're gonna learn from this. We are gonna use penetrations and when things go wrong, this is how we're gonna change. My, my argument used to be and the team used to wince when I would say this, never let a good crisis go to waste. <laughs> this is how you drive change in bureaucracies that don't like change. Yep. This is how you drive change in hierarchical organizations. You use crisis and potential negative consequence as a way to convince decision makers that they need to do things differently. And I was always a huge fan of that. And I, every time we had something wrong, I always tried to talk to the team about, we're gonna, we're gonna make this so we're better coming out of this than we were going into this. We're gonna use this to drive change. But I mean, it's easier said than done. I acknowledge it. Right. But it all started to me with a thought process and a cultural thing. Yeah. Um, thanks, Mike. We should open it to questions. Yes. I don't want to hog up all the time. That would be unfair for you guys. Um, so we've got about 18 minutes left. So we want to open up to the audience. You can ask to, any question on any to topic. To ask some questions. So here's your chance. Wait, we got a microphone coming. Wait, I see somebody in the back. So we'll do over there. And then, sir, in the green shirt, I see you. You're here. You're ready. You were enthusiastic. <laughs> You were ready to go. So uh, looking back at history, mm -hmm. um, perspective, what uh, organization uh, within the uh, government should have taken more notice of the um, activity around Jade Helm? Uh, I'm sorry, the activity around what? The, the, what in retrospect are seen as Russian psyops, the oh, whole oh, Jade oh. Helm kerfuffle in 2016. Jack. So I thought, I thought the biggest area, and I was part of that team, I thought the biggest area where you can use the word failed or we weren't as aggressive as we should have been, we thought that by informing the normal working levels that we dealt with in the private sector, that that would be sufficient. And if I had to do it, and I, I used to say this to Jim Comey, you know, Jim, if we had to do this all over again, we should have been going to CEOs, we should have been going to boards, we shouldn't have just been talking to CIOs, risk officers, CISOs, and this is something that, you know, you and I at, at the senior levels in our, in our organization, we should have been doing more of. Instead, we delegated this down both within our organizations and also the organizations that we're dealing with. And so I watched us burn a lot of time where I thought, where this was playing out was we would talk to company collectively, we the government, not just companies, in some case political parties, other things in 2016 and in 2015, and we'd say, hey, look, the Russians are inside. You know, 60 days would go by and I'm going, I'm still watching the Russians inside your structure. What, what is going on? What, why, why aren't we changing behavior? Why, don't, don't you realize you have a problem? And I just thought we should have done it a little differently. Um, the, the next element I would say is you have to acknowledge there's no one single organization in the government that has overall responsibility here. FBI is the lead for law enforcement and investigative. The Department of Homeland Security has overall lead for government application of cyber capacity and capability to help the private sector and has the broad mandate to handle cybersecurity writ large um, as a government function. DOD, we had the largest capacity. Um, in some ways, I would also argue we had the deepest expertise um, just because we, we viewed cyber as a core capability. We had invested billions in it over time. We had created a very specialized workforce. We had developed capabilities over time. Um, but on the other hand, it's a challenge in a democratic society where the role of the government can be a source of tension for our citizens. Hey, look, I don't want... My rights are what matter. It's the founding principle of our nation. And what differentiates us, I would argue, from almost every other nation in the world. We said first and foremost, the core idea of America is that the rights of the individual are primus, have primacy. That we will, even as we acknowledge, we need to create government capacity, we need the means for collective security, we need the means for defense, but we will never let government get to a point where it tramples the rights of the individual as important as government is. So there's always that pressure in our country about what is the role of the government? What do you want the DOD doing? What do you want the government doing here? I just think cyber is gonna force us to step back 
and ask ourselves some pretty fundamental questions. Are there some things we need to look at doing differently here? Sir. Yes. Um, never lose the value of a crisis is a, <laughs> is a lifelong engineering leader. I, I, those echo with me, right? Oh. Because I feel controls engineers learn so much in critical infrastructure when stuff breaks when you're working on the weekend. Right. Um, what would you suggest I do when I go back to work Monday? I'm in the private sector, we're a supplier, to increase my engagement with the three-letter acronyms. Um, I, we poke around the edges, we're not allowed any ISAC because we're a vendor, which I respect. Mm. Um, we've got connections in EEI, we, we work with ICS CERT, but I don't feel anything more than procedurally check in boxes. Right, so the first thing I would, I would argue is DHS, Department of Homeland Security, in some ways is the collective center of gravity. They have the overall mandate for the government, as I said. And when you're not in a penetration scenario, when you're not in a law enforcement criminal investigation kind of scenario, they're the starting point to me. You can go online and look at, uh, Chris Krebs is the leader of, of the, the cyber element within DHS. You can go online, take a look, you pull down, you'll see there's a, a, a couple areas where you can actually reach out to them and have a discussion with them. The other thing I would argue is take a look at NIST within the government. Um, help me with, I always blow the, the national, what does ISP stand for? Institute of Standards. Technology. Institute of Standards and Technology. Technology. Could we have someone here from NIST? NIST Somewhere. has done some, and, and the broader government, we all partnered together. NIST has done some great work on basic principles of cybersecurity. So I always encourage people, take a look at that work. It's a good starting point. You can customize it as you need to within your structure, but that's a good place to start. And again, you can start online. They've got a great structure that enables you to use the portal as a way to then subsequently talk to the men and women of NIST who do some great work. So those are two starting points that I give you as example. Is there anybody over here? Because we want to make sure we're uniform over. Oh, I see somebody over here. Uh, thanks, uh, Admiral Rogers, for being here today. It's very insightful. Um, what do you think the role of, of uh, the private sector is in terms of offensive, knowing that you know, government is definitely you know, taking those actions, but in the private sector, Legal liability, our risk is uh, you know, extraordinary. Pretty so, significant. Yeah. <laughs> so, I am a believer, now I'll show you my military war college education. I'm a believer in the Westphalian model of the role of the state, <laughs> which generates from 1641. I believe that the application of force, whether it's kinetic, bombs, missiles, bullets, or non-kinetic software, mal, you know, that fundamentally the application of force is at its core a government role, a government responsibility. When these discussions used to come up, and I was in the government, and you know, in the sit room or in the Oval, the, the, the analogy I used to use with the senior most leadership of the government was, look, you, you often look to me and the men and women that I team with um, to, to, to try to help be the leaders in cybersecurity. Many days I feel like it's the Wild West and I'm the sheriff walking out on the street. And if you accept that analogy, then the last thing I want is more people walking out on the street with guns. So th this doesn't help me, it just complicates the problem set. Another thing that I always, and now that I find myself in the private sector, now I'm you know, on board, so you potentially have liability there. You know, one of the things I say is, you need to think long and hard about the second and third order liability potential here. If a company gets it wrong, if they don't attribute successfully where this activity came from, if they engage in activity that creates harm, not just in what they were going after, but potentially others, now you've got a massive liability issue and you really open yourself up. I would be really concerned about liability. And now, uh, one time I remember we're, we're sitting in the sit room and we're waiting for a, a cabinet level discussion to get started. And we're gonna be talking about cybersecurity and several, in the Obama administration, it worked out that almost all of the seniors happened to have been lawyers. They had legal backgrounds. And I can remember we're shooting, the, we're waiting for the president to come in. And I'm talking to some of them and we're, we're joking that myself and one other individual are like we're the only non-lawyers in the room. And some of them had been 
um, general counsels at Wall Street firms before they came into the government. And, and I said, so let's look at this scenario. Your company is attacked. You believe you know who did it and how they did it. You decide that it's in your company's best interest to try to either stop it or send a message and go back against the individual or groups that executed the activity. I said, when you were a general counsel, what would you have advised your financial firm? And they all said, oh man, we'd have told them no way, just the liability concerns. So in general, I'm not a proponent of it. The last comment I would make, we also need to be very precise about terminology. There are some things that I'm very comfortable with private companies doing that I would consider to be purely defensive. And there's a spectrum from those kind of purely defensive all the way up to truly offensive kinds of things. But at times, the phraseology I hear, I'm going, look, you could drive a truck through what you're talking about. You need to be very precise about just what response authority or actions are you contemplating here. Um, because the specifics really matter, particularly when it comes to the liability question. There was somebody over here who had their hand up before. Nope. Oh, there, we got a young lady over here. Come on. Hi, um, Hi I had a question for you on the- um, Uh-oh, you wrote it down. This is gonna be a good one. <laughs> right. So our, I'm from Atlanta and our local Congressman, Tom Graves, has introduced the Active Cyber Defense Act and this is because the dated um, Computer Fraud and Abuse Act really limits what um, the cyber community can do to fight back, you know, as far as corporations. And they can't um, fight against their cyber attacks. They're not allowed to use beacons. Their hands are really tied in terms of monitoring the behavior of the attackers. So Tom Graves has introduced this bill, and I think it's still, um, it's, it hasn't been passed yet. But um, the whole cyber community, I've read a lot in Security Week, actually, about the bill um, and, and what the community feels, because they feel like um, somebody like a Google has the cyber sophistication to hack back, so to speak, but does the average Fortune 500 company, I mean, they could actually do a lot more collateral damage, uh, because a lot of times the attackers are so sophisticated, they've covered their tracks, and they make it look like somebody else has attacked, and so when then you try to attack back, you're actually hurting the wrong people. The wrong people. Right. It's also you know, a national security risk because if major oil companies think that, say, China has attacked them, I mean, do we really want corporations attacking nation states? So I was just curious what your thought process was on, is the, um, the CFAA dated and we need to update it? What do you think about Tom Graves? So, so first of all, I have not seen the specifics of the legislation, so I'm not gonna comment on something I haven't seen, I'm not knowledgeable about. It's a very un-DC approach to business, but it's just the way I like to lead life. If I'm not familiar with it and don't have direct knowledge, I always thought it's not appropriate for me to comment on it. Broadly, to go back to the previous discussion, though, it starts to me with a discussion about, so just what are we comfortable with the private sector doing? Because as you've said, there, there are some very simple, what I would call passive defensive things that I'd be very comfortable with. On the other hand, there are some things that I would go, wow, this could be really escalatory if you got it wrong. That, there's huge second and third order effects. This makes me nervous. I wouldn't go down that road. So I, I think the devil's in the details on this. And the other challenge to remember is once you create a law, you're trying to create a legal framework that applies, as you have indicated, across a broad spectrum of organizations. Some who have literally, if you look at the biggest banks, you know, they will publicly acknowledge they have cybersecurity baseline budgets of 500, you know, million dollars a year, half a billion dollars just as a baseline. That doesn't include what they do for um, major issue response. How many companies can afford a baseline of half a billion dollars for a cybersecurity budget? So when we pass laws, they, you know, broadly, they, they apply equally from the biggest organizations to the littlest organizations. And so I am always mindful of, Try to come up with solutions that scale across this spectrum because coming up with solutions that only work for one part of that spectrum are not really good. You know, they're just not gonna get us the fundamental change that I, I think we need, so. The, oh, in the back, sir. Hey, good morning, uh, Admiral. Uh, my name is Mike McClung. I'm with Ampex Data Systems. Uh, hey, we're Mike. Silicon Valley a Small Business. Yeah. Uh, I'm a retired Air Force Colonel. I was at the Puzzle Palace years ago. Um, and uh, now I'm on the private That's sector. That's a euphemism for NSA. The public <laughs> right. the euphemism for NSA. Right. Um, 
our, our niche is uh, DOD in the federal space. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of uh, great companies uh, that are non-U.S. Uh, doing very good work uh, in the industrial control system sector. But DOD customers often want, you know, U.S. owned and operated. When we reach out to the DOD sector, we see that they're not exactly uh, hip to the uniqueness and differences of industrial control systems and OT or operational technology <laughs> as opposed to IT, right? Exactly. Um, how often did, did that difference and you know, different protocols, different techniques come across your desk? Um, or was it just all a bunch of IT stuff, right? Did, no, did you so ever talk down to that level? Yeah, so for me, between Cyber Command and NSA, this is always a huge deal because my attitude was, look, we're tasked with defending across the spectrum here. I just can't focus on the IT segment or I just can't focus on the OT segment. We gotta come up with strategy that works across these potential range of vulnerabilities here. Um, as I said, when, you know, when, I, when I started this journey, everything was IT, 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 and I still find the majority of, I would argue not just the government, but I see the same thing in the private sector, are still probably primarily IT focused, and I'm not arguing the answer is to forget about how important IT is. My argument is you need to look across the spectrum of capability within your organization, both IT and OT, do a risk-based approach here and that's what you need to focus on. Just don't pick one or the other. Do a risk-based approach where you prioritize, because that's the only way to, to, as I've said, to deal with this mismatch of resources versus requirements. Um, you know, the government traditionally, DOD, just looking across the spectrum, it's getting better, but probably more of the workforce was comfortable with the, and had more direct per, firsthand experience with the IT arena than the OT arena. The OT arena tended to be a little specialized. Um, so we gotta see how we can change that over time. This is an interesting point though about the international piece. I spent much of my time, look, I, I said, it's all about, in, as, I, as you've heard me say this morning, it's all about building integrated teams. And I want that team to have the best capabilities we can find. And I don't care if that capability is in the United States or it's within a key ally or partner. Now look, the, the, you, you have to take a risk-based approach. I'm not gonna create relationships where I'm sharing technology with Russia or China. I'm, I'm the first to acknowledge that, guys, we're not going down that road. On the other hand, I felt very strongly we have got to be willing, again, using risk-based approach, one size didn't fit all, but I said, look, there are key allies and friends out there that I believe who we can work with who have shown a history of their willingness to partner with us, who have shown the willingness to protect the technologies that we have shared with them in other areas besides cyber, and that we um, should be willing to embrace them. Now, we also took a risk-based approach. There were some things I was willing to do with some nations that, quite frankly, I said flat out, we're not doing this with others. The risk is too high to me, I'm uncomfortable. But I was also adamant, I don't want a one-sized approach fits all. And so for me, for example, in this new life, I intentionally have chosen to work with some non-US firms because I believe they have some great technology, some great capability, and I wanna see that capability applied as broadly as possible. And I thought, hey, it's a strong partner nation. I did great things with them when I was in uniform. I'd like to try to continue to do great things with them when I'm not in uniform. Um, so I, I'm a fan of, we take a risk-based approach, but we've gotta be willing to think more broadly. And the world's just so much more integrated. It's just the way things are. We're gonna sub-optimize if we're not careful. That's not the intent, but it could be one of the outcomes. Got one, two here, and then I think that'll, well, the middle section, then we'll finish up here, because we're down to 14 seconds, so we'll do, can you bring the microphone all the way we'll up here? We'll sacrifice a couple minutes of break if we need to. Uh, Ma'am, all the way up here? Second row, second row from the very front. Keep coming, keep coming. Warmer, warmer. Okay. Morning. Uh, I'm curious if in, in the recent past where we've had public information exposed and your Equifaxes and Marriott's and uh, uh, Facebook's Say that other, again. You're, you're, where public information has been exposed in data breaches, do you ever see a future where there's going to be mandated penalties for companies that fail to protect their data? You can already see there's a swing um, for example, I, I'd encourage everybody, re, when the government find Facebook read the memorandum that the government sent with the fine. It talked about corporate responsibility to protect data, 
It talked about corporate responsibility to put controls in place. It talked about corporate responsibility when controls aren't followed. It talked about corporate responsibility from a board and an, and an officer perspective about what the role was. I thought the government was clearly trying to send a message here. There is a level of corporate responsibility here that we are not seeing embraced in the private sector that we believe needs to be. The question about should there be criminal liability, the way I used to phrase it within the government is I was trying to deal with, hey, how do we change this culture? One of the things I used to tell my bosses, and I can remember they would look at me like, I, I said, sir, never underestimate the power of pain to shape human behavior. If we incentivize the outcomes we want and we disincentivize the outcomes that we don't want, that's how you change behavior. And so we need to spend some time asking ourselves, how do we incentivize good cybersecurity practice? And also, how do we potentially de-incentivize or punish bad cyber practice? Um, should it go to the point where we hold them criminal liability, I'd want more details, like, so what was the level of control in place? Was it they didn't have anything? Was it they had a good system, they didn't follow it? Was it, hey, this really was something unique, this really was a zero date? So I'm leery about a one-size-fits-all approach, but I do think organizations should be spending time thinking about how do I incentivize the cybersecurity behaviors I want to see, and how do I disincentivize or more directly potentially punish the behaviors that I don't want to see, because that is how you will change human behavior. It's just the nature of the human condition in my experience. And again, that goes to that, the hard part isn't the technology. The hardest part is how you change behavior and how you change culture. Sir, you're gonna take us home. <clears throat> Ura, sir. Ura. Uh, back in uh, March, we experienced the first kinetic attack. Um, how far along do you think uh, will America do uh, uh, kinetic attacks as well between Israel and Iran. So uh, I want to make sure I understand it. Tell me what kinetic attack we're talking about specifically. Oh, uh, kinetic attack, um, explode, um, blowing up the attacker instead of uh, anything else pretty much. They blew him up, Israel and Iran. Now we're talking about a, a cyber response where we oh, okay. over, over a cyber response. So the first thing when 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 I was in the in the structure, one of the arguments I always tried to make was, look, just because somebody comes at us in cyber doesn't mean we got to respond in cyber. Second point I used used to make to our teams, both at Cyber Command and NSA, but primarily at Cyber Command, look, there is a physical dimension to all of this. Somewhere in the world, there is a server configuration that physically resides in a latitude and longitude in a building somewhere. There is a human sitting at a keyboard somewhere who is executing this. So there is a physical dimension to this virtual activity that we are watching. One of the potential response strategies, therefore, we should consider is, do we want to go after the physical side of this virtual activity? Hey, we're going to T-land the server farm, because I can tell you where the servers are. I, I can tell you their, their configuration. I can tell you where this, and not in every case, but in some. We, we had a couple discussions where I would say, I tell you where the server configuration is. You know, we can, we can do a TLAM, a Tomahawk missile attack. There's, there's some physical things that we could do here. Likewise, a, uh, this activity is occurring with a human who is physically in a location. Um, we did predator drone, drone strikes, for example, in the terrorism world all the time. Hey, is there an equivalent in, in the cyber world if we make the decision that we've reached that threshold? Now, don't forget for one second, the application of force, kinetically or non-kinetically, <laughs> is an incredibly important decision that you don't take lightly. And every time in the DOD we applied force, we always ensured we followed the law of armed conflict, that we ensured that what we did was both proportional and very discreet and specific. So if someone caused us minor damage, we didn't go back to them and say, we're gonna take out all your petroleum infrastructure. We tried to be proportionate because that's what the law of armed conflict says we should do when it comes to applying force. So my argument always was, to finish the answer to your question, number one, don't get sucked into just because they did this, we have to respond the same way. So consider the physical world, the application of armed force is a potential 
It's not the default, but you should consider it as a potential, number one. And number two, remember, whether we apply it physically or we apply it virtually in the form of malware or a software program that's specifically written to overcome a specific network configuration to achieve a specific effect, if we're going to go down that road either way, make sure that what we're doing is very precise, very proportional, and it fully complies with the law of armed conflict, even as we have to acknowledge cyber law right now in terms of how you apply force in the world of cyber, there is not an international consensus on this issue, and there is not a well-recognized, long-standing set of practices. So we're still feeling our way through this. And my argument always was, so take what's worked in the physical world, apply it to the virtual world as a starting point, and we'll evolve it over time. With that, thank you all uh, very, very much. Let me conclude with just by saying, this is hard work. This is not about coming up with a plan and don't worry, in six months or a year, we're gonna declare victory. This is about sustained focus effort, about trying to create partnerships between the technical side of an organization and its leadership, about trying to overlay risk and prioritization to some really tough problems, about realizing that the greatest challenge is in culture, it's not in technology, but that to get where we need to be, we have got to change behavior and culture. Because if we don't do that, we are always going to be on the wrong side of this. And with that, I thank you very, very much for your time today. Thanks. Thank you, Mike.